All right, well, welcome to ESC 1000, Introduction to Earth Science. I am your instructor, Dave Cacciarella, and this is the cover of your textbook, The Good Earth, An Introduction to Earth Science uh, by David McConnell and David Steer. Interesting feature in the front of this, this is the Molokini Crater just off the coastline of the island of Maui. And I want you to look at the island of Maui back there in the background. You can see that it kind of looks like uh, maybe a contact lens on, on its side or even the shield of a Roman soldier on its side. And that's because uh, most of the Hawaiian islands, or all of the Hawaiian islands, are um, volcanoes. They grew up out of the, uh, the seabed and they are what is known as shield volcanoes based on the composition of the magma and the lava that creates them. So we're going to learn a lot about the earth and earth science. And one of the things we're going to talk about will be shield volcanoes. And then this little crater that's out here uh, in the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, actually part of this volcanic system. This is a cinder cone that popped up on the side of this shield volcano at a previous time. Uh, now a beautiful spot for diving and a marine sanctuary. So we're going to talk about why the earth is the way it is and how it got that way and it's always better to know and that's why earth science is such a great thing to study so this is an introduction to earth science this is chapter one we're going to talk about earth science and earth systems the scope of earth science what it means to do science to do good science or maybe to do bad science and then where scientists fit into society this is a typical uh, beginning of any uh, introductory science class and then we're going to jump into what's happening with the earth our odyssey that is the study of earth science begins with the understanding that the earth is a complex system of interacting rock water air and life where components and interactions of these four systems cycle energy and mass throughout the whole system the four systems of course being the atmosphere the air and the weather the hydrosphere the water and the ice the biosphere the plants and the animals and the geosphere the land and the rocks now this cycling of energy of mass refers to the conservation of energy and the conservation of mass they, this is the fundamental concept of physics that says within some domain neither energy or mass can be created or destroyed but they can be converted from one to the other which is where we get the basic formula e equals mc squared energy equals mass times the speed of light squared and the speed of light squared is a constant and so essentially uh, telling us that energy is equal to mass or energy and mass cannot be created or destroyed but can be uh, cycled back and forth from one to the other earth science and the earth system we know that earth science is the investigation of interactions among the four components of the earth system the atmosphere the hydrosphere the biosphere and the geosphere but it's also uh, includes the the interaction with the exosphere the sun and the assorted features from space uh, the exosphere sometimes considered the fifth earth system element so certainly we know the sun uh, interacts with the earth system providing us ultimately with all the energy at the earth system and then the moon also interacts with the earth system with tidal forces and gravity so uh, it's not just the four systems those are the ones we can see and touch here on earth there's also uh, the fifth system what's in space and, and all around us in space to understand earth science we need to understand what science is at its core and in its essence science is simply a process of discovery now it's a process of discovery that increases our body of knowledge. Science is information that can be learned, much of it just waiting to be discovered. It's science is also the curiosity and cre creativity of scientists in their search for answers to critical questions. But what science is not is a list of facts to be memorized. Earth science is a detective story in which teams of investigators, not always even working together, but teams of investigators piece together evidence to generate well-founded explanations of the workings of our planet. And that evidence comes from observations and data. How do Earth scientists collect that data? Well, through direct measurements, indirect information, and modeling. And of course, direct measurements is literally going out there and measuring what's happening on the Earth in the crust, uh, in a sinkhole, the Grand Canyon, collecting uh, rock samples from an outcrop. Samples are data collected at field locations. Now, indirect information is when data is collected, but then it's used for the interpretation of something else completely. For instance, we collect 
ice cores, literally long cores of ice, many meters long down into the glacier on top of Antarctica. And from those ice cores, by studying that ice and the gas bubbles in that ice, we can interpretate uh, and, and uh, make interpretations, that is, of, of other things such as climate in the, the distant past. So indirect information is collecting data and then using that data for the interpretation of something else and of course modeling talk a lot about modeling we talk about hurricanes and weather weather models hurricane models uh, modeling is also the uh, creation of physical models like a wave tank in which we can study how waves interact and uh, computer models and physical models together maybe to determine uh, how the Gulf of Mexico would handle a hurricane not uh, the winds and the rain but the storm surge and how large bodies of water deal with uh, waves being pushed across them we use physical uh, wave tanks and computer models to collect that data. So here are some examples of that data collection. Uh, in the upper left, technician is uh, collecting bottles of water from the ocean, samples of ocean water for lots of different research. Uh, that's an example of direct measurement. And there's one of those ice cores. Uh, you can see the scientists there in the lower right. Ice core can be used to measure the composition of the atmosphere in the distant past. And that's a, an example of the collection of indirect information. And here is an example of one of those wave pools. Now look at the left side of this, uh, this picture. You can see the people. So this gives you an idea of, of just how large this wave pool actually is. And that is your example of physical modeling. And during the course of this class, we're also going to take a look at uh, computer models, specifically with weather models. By now, most of you in one science class or another have been exposed to the idea of the scientific method. And the scientific method is that systematic approach to answering questions. And to do this, we need observations, a testable hypothesis, and one or more predictions based on that hypothesis. The observations, of course, empirical facts, measurements, information, data collected, using the senses, something that can be confirmed by others, whether it's actual observations in the field or observations and data based on models. That hypothesis, a testable explanation of the facts of the observations that can also be verified or falsified through experimentation. So it's an explanation of those facts of that data that you that you measured or observed, but it's a, a testable explanation that can be verified or in some cases falsified through experimentation. And then a prediction. With all this, you can make a prediction, a statement of what will happen in a given situation or set of circumstances based on those hypotheses and observations. The hypothesis or that explanation of data or observations can be tested using either inductive or deductive reasoning. Remember, a hypothesis has to be uh, able to be uh, tested by others uh, in order for it to be verified. So what is inductive reasoning? Drawing general conclusions from specific observations. So it involves recognizing patterns in the data. You're drawing general conclusions from specific observations. Here is an example of inductive reasoning. Number one, three massive hurricanes caused significant damage to the United States during 2005. Number two, Hurricane Katrina had a pressure of 902 millibars, Hurricane Rita 898 millibars, and Hurricane Wilma 882 millibars. The inductive reasoning would allow you to draw the general conclusion based on specific observations that massive hurricanes with low air pressure around 900 millibars or less will cause large amounts of damage if they make landfall. Knowing that those three hurricanes with central pressures of around 900 millibars cause massive damage can allow you to make that general conclusion that massive hurricanes with central pressures of about 900 millibars will cause large amounts of damage if they make landfall. The other methodology that can be used to test the hypothesis is deductive reasoning. Now in deductive reasoning you are drawing specific conclusions based on general principles. This involves applying laws and principles to look at the data or the observations and then to come up with specific conclusions about that data or those observations. Here is an example of deductive reasoning from the world of tropical meteorology again. Number one, all hurricanes form as low pressure systems over oceans. Number two, 
Hurricane Sandy is forming in the Atlantic. So the deductive reasoning or the specific conclusion based on a general principle is Hurricane Sandy must be a low pressure system. If all hurricanes form as low pressure systems over oceans and Hurricane Sandy is forming over the Atlantic, which is an ocean, we then know that Hurricane Sandy is also a low pressure system using deductive reasoning. We deduce that it must also be a low pressure system. Back to the general notion of the scientific method. The scientific method is, uh, is something that allows us to do science well, to do good science, and science follows some basic rules that are loosely defined as the scientific method. So a scientific hypothesis is a tentative thing. It, it can be changed. It's, it's something that's not absolute. It's just a hypothesis, and that hypothesis must be able to be either completely or partially changed. A scientific hypothesis should be logical, predictable, and readily testable, and test results should either support or falsify the hypothesis. A scientific hypothesis is based on data from empirical, based on experience, something you actually saw, empirical observations or experiments. And a scientific hypothesis offers a well-defined natural cause to explain a natural event. If the hypothesis is saying that uh, volcanoes cause lots more CO2, carbon dioxide, to be in the atmosphere, then there has to be a well-defined natural cause that shows how the CO2 gets from the volcano to the atmosphere or how the CO2 causes, or how the volcano causes CO2 to be in the atmosphere. There has to be a well-defined natural cause. So here is another example of a hypothesis. This is an emerging hypothesis and a hypothesis that we hear a lot about in the media today. And we're going to show how this hypothesis has to be tentative, predictable, empirical, and also have a natural cause. Global warming. Average temperature of the Earth is increasing due to a buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So that's our hypothesis. We look at all the data, we make all these observations, and our hypothesis is that global warming is occurring, or our hypothesis is that the average temperature of the Earth is increasing due to the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. That's the reason why the Earth's temperature is increasing, because of the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Not because the sun is hotter, or the core of the Earth is hotter, or there's a second star close by, but the hypothesis is that greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are building up, the Earth is warming. This hypothesis is tentative, Estimates of how much temperature is increasing will change, meaning some scientists and some models give us uh, a 2 or 3 degree temperature increase over 50 years. Some give us a 2 or 3 temperature increase uh, over 500 years. It's also predictable. The prediction is that if greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide increase by this amount, then temperatures will increase by that amount. It's empirical. We are making measurements of increasing global temperatures. We can we have a record of global temperatures, and we can see an increase there. And we also have a record of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and we can see the similar increase there. So it's an empirical thing. We actually have uh, experience or observations to uh, to back this up, and we can provide this natural cause. Climate records, literally over 500,000 years show parallel changes in temperature in greenhouse gases. So we can show how there's a natural cause that uh, greenhouse gases increase the Earth's temperature uh, because greenhouse gases absorb infrared radiation being emitted by the Earth and hold it. And that's the natural cause. So let's clear up the confusion between hypothesis theory and law. All right, a scientific hypothesis is a testable explanation of facts or observations or data. Okay, it's a testable explanation of the facts. Uh, you see a bunch of this and you give an explanation of that. Continued observations over time and by others will confirm the hypothesis. Yeah, we saw a bunch of the same thing and that confirms your hypothesis. A hypothesis is tentative. It has to be able to change if new information is discovered. Yes, we saw a bunch of the same thing, but we also saw this, and that slightly changes your explanation. 
A scientific theory is now a well-substantiated explanation of some aspect of the natural world that can incorporate facts, laws, inferences, and tested hypothesis. A theory now is when we basically have an agreement by the lion's share of the scientific community uh, based on uh, the same observations and the same data that they've come to the same conclusions. And a theory that we're going to talk in detail about later uh, in the course is going to be the theory of plate tectonics. And it's an excellent example showing how good science built on observations over literally hundreds of years to come up with one theory after another theory. And now we have a scientific theory that is well substantiated. Scientific law is something that is so strong and so rigid that we typically don't see new scientific laws. There have been lots of laws uh, in the past, um, but this notion that a hypothesis in a theory has to be able to be changed if new information is discovered makes it more difficult to have a scientific law. But a scientific law is then a statement that is so strongly supported by theory and observations that they are considered uh, unchanging in nature. And um, again, there are some things that we think are absolutely permanent, don't change, they'll always be this way, the sun will come up tomorrow, that would be a law. But if we had new data that came in uh, that was able to change the, uh, the explanation or, or change the prediction, uh, then that's where scientific laws may not hold up. But a scientific law is something that's so strongly supported that we think that it will always happen that way. So the willingness to continually question prevailing ideas and to modify or discard them as new information becomes available is really the strength of science. This notion that if new information comes in, we've got to be able to get rid of, discard, or at least change old ideas. And if you're not willing to change with new data, then you're not doing good science. Uh, no scientist makes an observation or suggests a hypothesis or develops a theory alone. This is all done by the entire scientific community with different people testing hypotheses separately, testing ideas separately, bringing in data separately, and all coming to the same conclusion. Now, I have used the term good science once or twice already, so what, what are the actual characteristics of good science? Scientific explanations are provisional. They're tentative. Okay? They can, they do, and they should change, particularly when new information comes about. And we've, we've sort of harped on that a little bit now, so that's, that should be clear to you, that if new information comes in, science has to be able to change. And if science is, can change, it's provisional, it's tentative, that's good science. Scientific explanation should be predictable and testable. Um, again, you should be able to test one to the other. You should be able to set up a situation, model it, whether physically or with a computer, or you should be able to run experiments in a lab that test those scientific explanations. Scientific explanations are based on observations or experiments, and therefore they have to be reproducible. Uh, if you uh, do an experiment that uh, proves that cold fusion uh, is possible and economical, and uh, so you go to claim that you can solve the world's energy problems. If that experiment is not reproducible by somebody else, then that is not good science. That's just uh, an outlandish claim. And then valid scientific hypothesis have to offer that well-defined natural cause or mechanism to explain the natural event. So, okay, um, volcanoes are a function of magma in the Earth's surface. So how did the magma get there? What's causing it to come up to the earth. I mean, there's got to be a, an explanation or a mechanism. And if you don't have that mechanism in place, that's not good science. Not all science is good science. And this can, of course, be of particular concern when you're dealing about science as reported in the popular media. Science absolutely cannot answer every question. It can't deal with ethics, morality, or culture, or societal norms. There are no uh, experiments that can uh, come up with uh, theories or laws that control any of those things. But oftentimes uh, people use science or attack science in order to advance uh, their own personal agenda. So the common pitfalls or the common characteristics of bad science include attacking the scientist rather than the science, the misuse of authority, uh, confusing cause and effect, or just bad data. So attacking scientists rather than the science, this is a situation where uh, individuals are attacked, uh, made personal attacks on them as opposed to the science that they're doing, and not uncommon when religious views uh, do conflict with science. 
Misuse of authority, and this is when people argue from the position of authority, and this often happens when politics conflicts with a science. Somebody in high authority takes a position that I'm in this position and therefore I'm right, uh, and they're not really considering the science. Confusing cause and effect. This notion that if this happened, then that must have been the reason. Um, and that's not always the case. Sometimes the reason for occurrences is completely different. So confusing cause and effect and also poor statistics, using bad data, uh, empirical data incorrectly, just good data sometimes used incorrectly, all parts of uh, characteristics of bad science. So what is society's responsibility to science and what is science's responsibility to society. It seems like an open-ended question, but when we're talking about the latter, there's actually some very specific points. Uh, scientists and science is meant to alert people to the earth processes, specifically hazards, that could possibly uh, cause damage or loss of life. Uh, a science is also there to provide for material needs of society by managing natural resources. Uh, science is there to protect us from our own activities that may endanger the natural environment. And science is there to ensure for the future of humanity from global threats, such as climate change or near-Earth objects, asteroid impacts, uh, that type of thing. How do science and society interact? Well, Earth's scientists' role in society is to alert people to the earth processes or hazards that may cause damage or loss of life. So which type of natural hazards are most significant in the region where you live? So you, know, you can see Florida here with Jacksonville and New Orleans as well. Um, the hurricane and uh, potentially flooding. Uh, in our case, flooding is going to be coastal flooding, which is likely to be brought on by a tropical storm. But in, in all different parts of the country, there are different hazards that scientists are responsible uh, for letting people know about. For instance, you know, if you live in Seattle or San Francisco or Los Angeles, you're fairly aware already that earthquakes are a problem. But did you know if you were in Memphis, earthquakes, earthquakes can be an issue as well? Uh, the types of things that uh, scientists or scientists are responsible to let people know about. In terms of alerting people to Earth's processes, uh, in terms of hazards that may cause damage or loss of life, so great, you let somebody know. What, what, what else can a scientist do? Well, uh, scientists work toward prevention and also toward mitigation or adjustment, as it's listed on the slide. Prevention, of course, is you know, which hazards are we most likely or least uh, possibly able to prevent? Uh, flooding is one of those things. Uh, flooding can be prevented uh, through flood walls or levees. Um, hurricanes probably can't be prevented. Tornadoes, uh, likely not. But science can uh, have strategies for minimizing the impacts of those hazards, like building codes in areas of uh, frequent earthquakes. So that's adjustments made by science or mitigation strategies proposed by scientists. Earth scientists should also help to provide for material needs of society by managing natural resources, including renewable resources such as water and soil, also non-renewable resources such as oil, coal, and metals. And Earth scientists typically want to work toward a sustainable society, a society that satisfies its need for resources without jeopardizing the needs of future generations. Do we have a sustainable society now? Are we capable of becoming a sustainable society in the future? And this notion of sustainable or sustainability uh, is something that uh, as you're looking toward your coursework in the future and what you might want to study further and uh, perhaps even make a, a career out of, sustainability is a word that we're finding in very high level positions now in major corporations that did not exist 10 years ago. And so sustainability Sustainability and the, the science of sustainability is a great way in the future to make a living. Earth scientists also want to protect us from activities that may endanger natural environments. So Earth scientists should be working toward uh, preventing human-induced air and water pollution that can cause long-term harmful effects to ecosystems. It should uh, provide methods in the science uh, to help clean up following major catastrophes like Deepwater Horizon, the oil spill along the Alabama coastline. So that's another role of the Earth scientists in society is the protection uh, from, uh, of, uh, of society from activities that may endanger natural resources. In terms of the role that Earth scientists play in society, lastly, 
and maybe this is a bit of a larger scale but lastly earth scientists are there to help ensure the future of humanity from global threats now the two main global threats we're talking about these days and we're going to talk a lot about in this course are climate change of course but also things like near earth objects and asteroid impacts and earth scientists are looking at both of these situations to try and determine can we prevent them or if we can't prevent them can we at least mitigate the impact so as you can see the earth scientist not just about rocks but has a major role in society and helping society be a better place for all of us so we'll wrap up chapter one and an introduction into earth science with a look at where humans where homo sapiens stand in the history of earth and what has been the impact of the species homo sapiens on earth so Oh, speaking of theories, one theory that had to change a great deal as new data came to light was the theory as to how old the Earth is and how did the Earth get here. Um, geologists or scientists uh, think of uh, the time that Earth has been in existence on a scale known as the geologic time scale. And the geologic time scale is the scale of uh, distinct time intervals from right now all the way back to the formation of the planet and they recognize some of those distinct time intervals based on classic features that they find in the rock record we can go to the Grand Canyon and because the Grand Canyon or the whole Colorado Plateau was uplifted the whole massive region of the Four Corners area uplifted uh, by some tectonic activity and then the um, the Colorado River dug down uh, into that uplifted rock and exposed all these different layers uh, from the Neogene to the Paleocene to the Cretaceous down to the, uh, the Devonian and the Ordovician all the way down to the Cambrian. We can see these distinct time intervals in the rock record of the geologic time scale. Now on the left and millions of years you go down that column and you get all the way back to 4500 million years not 4 million years not 45 million years not 450 million years but 4500 million years or 4.5 billion years ago and scientists or scientists uh, believe that the earth uh, was formed some 4.5 billion years ago and uh, in, in the very beginning very little exists in the rock record uh, known as the Hayden uh, a period and uh, really right on through the Proterozoic uh, period which only takes us uh, takes us all the way up almost 4,000 of those 4,500 million years so we really don't begin to see things in the rock record until we get to that period of about 500 million years ago uh, the Phanerozoic uh, and we're talking about the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic uh, and and from that we we start to see things in the rock record and, and the point of this is first off to try and give you your very first peek at geologic time and just how large it is and then some idea how the eons and the eras and the periods and the epics have been broken down the Paleozoic broken down into the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, uh, and and so on and so on, and then let's say the uh, the uh, the Carboniferous period is the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian, and, and that's when coal was being formed. So all these different periods and epochs and eras and even eons are all distinct in the rock record, and that's your geologic time record. So if we go all the way up to the Cenozoic era and then into what's known as a quaternary period we see the Paleocene, the Eocene, uh, on up to the Pleistocene, that's the Ice Age, and the Holocene. So the Holocene is the the epic that is given to the last 11,700 years of the Earth's history and this 11,000 year period is the time since the end of the last major ice age so it was during the Pleistocene that the last major ice age occurred now since then there have been small climatic shifts uh, we've had some warmer periods some cooler periods uh, but generally in the Holocene it's been a relatively warm period and that's a, what refer, what's referred to as interglacial period between uh, glaciations and so um, the the epic that we are in right now 10,000 11,700 years ago until present is known as the Holocene and scientists or at least some scientists are beginning to think that we need to put a new 
a line, a new change uh, in the in the record, and have a new epic, and have the Holocene be something that's in the past, and a new epic based on the impact that humans, Homo sapiens, have had in the rock record. So scientists like Nobel Prize winning scientist Paul Crutzen has suggested that human activity has produced such a sweeping change to the Earth itself since about the time of the Industrial Revolution that we have a new period now uh, in Earth that will be known as the Anthropocene. And so the suggestion that is if, if the Earth is around another four and a half billion years that uh, geologists looking at the rock record would see the places seen the Ice Age, see all the, the things in the rock that say the Ice Ages were occurring, um, things that show that glaciers were around and then would see in the, in the same in the, in the rock record above that uh, the Holocene which is that, that more temperate warmer period of about 11,000 years 11,700 years and these scientists are suggesting that that then they begin to see a change in the rock record and that change in the rock record would have begun to occur sometime around the late 1800s during the industrial revolution when suddenly scientists would begin to see things in the rock record like an in increase in co2 um, that indicated the impact of humans on the planet and that new epic they want to refer to as the Anthropocene. All right, well, that was chapter one of The Good Earth, Introduction to Earth Science. Again, I'm your instructor, Dave Cacciarella, and we'll see you for chapter two.